Well, we're looking to John chapter 2 this morning. Look there with me, if you would, please, today. And don't be afraid today. I, I, I uh, thanked the greeters. Don't you appreciate our greeters? I thanked the greeters this morning for distributing my 15-pound outline. And I'm so glad that reputations are changing around here. Someone saw the outline this morning and asked Pastor Peter if he was preaching. <laughs> <laughs> this morning. I, I used to have the reputation around here as the faster pastor. It had nothing to do with my preaching. It had to do with my driving. And people used to say I drove like Jehu in the Old Testament. I drove like a madman. And uh, I, I, I am, uh, but I, I have to say that I have been the longer preacher at times, but thanks to the addition of Pastor Peter to our staff, I'm no longer the most long-winded pastor on the church. Oh, I'm just teasing, Pastor Peter, just teasing. Pastor Peter's a great preacher. And uh, by the way, I forgot his announcement this morning about the upcoming Veterans Fellowship meeting. Uh, take a look in the bulletin and find out more information about that. The last one, the first one we had was an awesome meeting together. And so we invite all the veterans to be a part of that upcoming in about a week and a half. John chapter 2, verse 13 is where we'll begin reading this morning. The scripture says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Now, please don't anyone overturn the table that is selling youth spaghetti supper tickets today based on the scripture reading today. Jesus drove them all out of the temple. And verse 17 says his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your house. That's our title this morning. We look to one additional scripture from Psalm 122 verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. How many of you this morning were glad when it was time to come to church? Let me see your hand. And everybody else, you're permitted a quick lie in the house of the Lord today for just this mo. Just this mo. How many of you, you love to go to church in general? I do. I've been, go I've been going to church all of my life. I was born on a Sunday morning, can't you tell by looking at me? Born on the Lord's Day. My twin brother Joel and I were born on, uh, b born on a Sunday morning. And uh, the very next Sunday morning, well, Joel was still in the hospital. He's, he lingered a little bit in the hospital. Joel was never quite as uh, strong or smart as me. Well, I have to be careful. He's gone on to heaven. He got to heaven before I did. That's for sure. But we were born, and, and on, the, set, on the, the, second, the next Sunday after that second one, mom had us in church. Dad and mom together, and we spent the rest of our lives going to church. And uh, as a result of being faithful churchgoers, can you believe it? Look at me. I, I never saw the entire movie of The Wizard of Oz until I was in my 30s. Because we had to go to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night. The wide world of Disney came, the wonderful world of Disney came on at six o'clock every Sunday evening and uh, we were getting ready for church and we watched till about 6.30 and then headed out. We never saw what was behind the curtain. And, uh, and boy, so I've lived my whole life going to church. I love, go I love to be in the house of the Lord. And do you know the scripture tells us today that Jesus himself loved to be at the house of the Lord. The scriptures prophesied about him in Psalm 69 that zeal for the house of the Lord, passion, enthusiasm for God's house would consume Jesus. It played out in the story that we read from the Gospel of John this morning as Jesus walked into the temple that day, drove out everybody that should not, were doing what they should not be doing in the house of the Lord and declared this house, this house of worship is supposed to be the house of God. And Jesus was consumed 
with enthusiasm for being in the house of the Lord. Our outline is a little intimidating this morning, but my intention today is to track through the scriptures our commitment to being in the house of God on a regular basis with the body of believers in church regularly. You know, a recent poll declared that for the first time in our American history, less of half, less than half Americans say they are associated, associated with and attend church on a regular basis. People have dropped out like flies. In fact, and not from here, thank the Lord, but in the past few years, even with the crisis that's taken place in our nation, many others have used the opportunity to drop out of regular church attendance. And for some, it's been a hard, hard time trying to rebuild faithfulness to the house of God. And yet the scriptures teach us that being in God's house with his people on a regular basis is a priority for the people of God. Now, I learned a long time. How many of you are glad to be here this morning? Say amen. <clears throat> I learned a long time ago when I was an associate pastor. I learned the hard way. I, I, I greeted a Sunday night crowd one time that uh, was a little slim, slim pickings, and I made some comment about it. And my boss, the pastor, said, and gave me this very wise principle never scold the people who are there because of the people who are not there. And how many think that's a pretty good principle? Now you're here this morning and most of you are, who are here on a veg, very regular basis in the house of God. And this sermon today, by the way, is not meant to scold anybody. It's to affirm and to declare again the importance of being in the house of God and making our time in the house of God everything it is intended to be. So let's look at the front side of the outline first, and we're going to talk about some principles regarding being in church. First is the word consumed. Everybody say consumed. Jesus was consumed with zeal for the house of God at Jerusalem, the temple of God. He was passionate about being present at the house of God. Verse 17, again, quotes from that 69th Psalm, his disciples remembered that, is, <coughs> that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. When Jesus was in, in Jerusalem, he was regularly at the temple, both on the Sabbath and throughout the week, teaching and being with the people of God at the house of the Lord. And he was passionate about that place. And he was also passionate about, passionate about the purposes of the house of God. We see it in the story in John chapter 2 this morning. To those who sold doves, Jesus said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Now, it is true that many church services in the world around us and many church gatherings, many, many church functions have nothing to do with the purpose for which God has designed, uh, you know, our being together as believers in the Lord Jesus. Jesus was intentionally determined that the house of God was going to function according to its God-given purpose. Make church what it's supposed to be. How many of you know church is not just a social gathering? Say amen. How many of you know church is not just a political event? Say amen. How many of you know church is not just a place to hobnob with people and get to know people for the sake of your business? Say amen. Church is a place where God is to be worshiped, where the presence of God is to be enjoyed, where the purposes of God are to be worked out. And Jesus was passionate about driving the things out of the house of God that should not be there and being sure that the house of God was a place where God's priorities were going to be fulfilled. He was consumed with passion for the house of God. Number two on our outline is the word compelled. Everybody say compelled. Jesus was compelled to be at the house of God interacting with believers even as a child. I love this story. We don't know much about the childhood of Jesus. In fact, this is really the, the one story we know from the scriptures 
about the childhood of Jesus between the time that he was born until the time he was about 30 years old. And yet this scripture, this story is recorded for a divine purpose. Jesus, as a child, was compelled to be at the house of the Lord. He was interacting at the house of God. John 2, 46 says, after three days, his parents, Jesus' parents, found him in the temple courts, still sitting among the teachers, listened to them, to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Here is Jesus, even as a child, disappearing from his parents. How many of you would have given him a good swat? No, not Jesus, you probably wouldn't. But here he is, Jesus, his parents are traveling out of Jerusalem. Actually, they're the ones that left him behind. It was their fault. And as they're, they're journeying back up toward the north, they realize, well, we forgot Jesus. Is there anybody here who's ever forgotten your kid at church? Let me, anybody here? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, several, several of you have forgot. How many of you, when you forgot your kid at church, you were intent on doing that and you were hoping somebody else would just take him? Yeah, I know. Well, they forgot Jesus in Jerusalem. And when they got back to Jerusalem, there he was in the temple courts, interacting at the house of God, talking about scripture and talking about the Lord as a child. And, and we see that as, he, as Jesus was doing that, he felt interconnected with the house of God. Verse 48 says, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Jesus said, this is the house of my heavenly father. I felt compelled to be here. And Jesus, even as a child, had the Holy Spirit working in and through his life as he's spending time at the house of God. Jesus was consumed with the house of God, passion for God's house. He was compelled to be at the house of God, even as a child. And number three is the word customized. Everybody say customized. Jesus made it his custom. He was in the regular custom as an adult, no doubt through his upbringing as well. He was in the regular custom of attending the Sabbath synagogue services with his fellow believers on a weekly basis. Now, as we think about the worship of the Jewish people in the country of Israel in Jesus' day, we have the temple at Jerusalem, and then in every community, we have these local synagogues. Basically, what you've got there is the main campus and the satellite campuses, okay? Because after all, people couldn't travel all the way into Jerusalem to worship and for teaching and things every Sabbath when they lived, you know, in other parts of the, of the country. And so they established what we might think of today as satellite uh, campuses, as, as synagogues and, and places where they would come together on the Sabbath day and worship the Lord together as the people of God. And Jesus, the scripture says, was in the habit, in the custom of being in church on the Sabbath day. Notice Jesus was present at the services. Luke 4, 16 says he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. That synagogue in Nazareth was Jesus' home church. He, he would travel in ministry all about and would be in a variety of synagogues all over the country, but this was his home church. Uh, how many of you, this is your home church? Say a good amen. What a privilege it is to have a home, a church home where we can gather together with family. And Jesus had a home church in his hometown of Nazareth and he was present at the services. But I want you to notice also that Jesus was participating powerfully in the services as well. Jesus was not just a pew warmer, or a couch potato when he went to church. 
When Jesus was at the synagogue, he was ministering and participating. Mark 1.21 says they went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. So here he is. He's participating in the teaching ministry. Not at, at the synagogue in Nazareth this time. Now over to the east in the synagogue in Capernaum. And Jesus rises to teach. Luke 13 says on, on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in another synagogue, one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. Does anybody remember the rest of that story? The Bible says she was bowed down. She could not straighten up. She came to church that day in that condition. Jesus was in the synagogue that day and Jesus saw that woman who had come to the house of God and Jesus began to move and minister powerfully and ultimately Jesus set that woman free from her condition in the house of God that day. How many of you know anything can happen when you go to church? Yeah. When the presence of God is there, when the Lord is working, anything can happen. And Jesus was ministering. He was in the custom of being in church on a regular basis, consumed, compelled, customized. The fourth point on today's outline is custom continued. As we see that the apostles of the Lord Jesus attended the Sabbath synagogue services in foreign cities where they introduced the gospel to, to the hearers. So as we track the journeys of the apostles in the book of Acts, we find out that even when they left the land of Israel, there were synagogues in all of these, many of these, most of these foreign cities that they traveled to. There were groups of Jewish people who had been scattered around the world due to a variety of historical events. And here they were in their city, but they were worshipers of God, even in the midst of foreign cities and wicked cities. And they gathered together on the Sabbath day to worship God out there in those foreign cities. And when the apostles, who were the, the, those carrying the gospel of Jesus out to the whole wide world, when they came to a city, they looked looked for the synagogue. Of course, they were Jewish themselves, the, 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 the 11 apostles and the 12th again, the 12 apostles of Jesus. They were Jewish followers and, and they were accustomed to being in the synagogues as well in church services. And so when they got to a town, they thought, well, the best place for us to share about Jesus is right in the church service that we're accustomed to. And they found the local synagogues and began in, the, in these foreign sitters, cities, they began the ministry in the church house. House. And they preached. Now, at times, many in the churches believed and came to faith in Christ. Sometimes the apostles were resisted and rejected, and they had to, they were kicked out of the, of the synagogue, and they had to start their own Christian church in the place. But, but they were accustomed to being in the house of the Lord. Paul the apostle, as he traveled, he was in the synagogue services regularly. I track it there on the outline for you. On the island of Cyprus, it, he started in the synagogue. In the city of Antioch, in the city of Iconium, we could trace these on the map. In Thessalonica and Berea and Athens and Corinth and in Ephesus, they started their ministry in the synagogue services and many times they would meet week after week. Sa sa the, the Sabbath, of course, was Saturday, the seventh day. So the sa Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath, they would meet to share the gospel in those local worship services. Now, I find it interesting as we're continuing on our outline to note that even in the one city where Paul planted a church where special note is made that there was no synagogue there for them to go to, at least it looks that, that way, in the city of Philippi. Notice in the city of Philippi, they didn't have a synagogue to go to, but they did have a, a Sabbath service. And I love this scripture, Acts 16, 13 says, on the Sabbath. We went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. Has anybody here ever been part of a new church plant? Let me see your hand. Anybody here ever been part of a new church plant where you didn't have a church house? Ah, welcome back, Joneses. Welcome back from Florida. 
Yeah. I pray for a good sunny warm day so they don't go back to Florida. Anybody else, anybody else ever been a part of a brand new church plan? If you've ever been a part of a brand new church plan, you know that you don't start out with a sanctuary like this or a property. Sometimes you start in somebody's house. Sometimes you start in a school building, right? Sometimes you rent a little facility down to, you, whatever the process is, before, you know, there's a, an established property or church building, a church plant often starts in a little place. Well, in the city of Philippi, we find that though there was no synagogue for the apostles to go to, they found a place to go to church on the Sabbath day. You know, when I was a kid growing up in church, we, we, when we would go on vacation, my parents would take us on vacation. I'm telling you, when it came to Sunday, our priority, and oftentimes, Dad, is this not true? On Saturday night, we drove all around trying to find a church that we could go to on Sunday morning. Some of the services we found on Sunday morning were good and some were not so good. But we made it a habit to be in church on the Lord's day and Paul, as he's traveling, even though there's no synagogue at Philippi, he goes out and he thinks, well, maybe there are some Jewish people meeting out by the riverside for a church service. There he found, listen, there he found a woman named Lydia who would become the first convert to Jesus in the city of Philippi and she would be a founding member of the great Philippian church because she was meeting on the Sabbath day. So the custom of meeting uh, weekly was continued. Our fifth point on the outline this morning is the word Christianized. Everybody say Christianized. All right, now thus far in our study, we've been talking about the Lord's house on the Sabbath day. The Jewish law declared that, that the Sabbath day was to be honored. And the people of God worshiped on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, because that's the day God rested from his work finished his work and rested on the Sabbath day. And so for the Jewish people, they met and still do meet today on the Sabbath day, the seventh day in observance of the commandment. But as the Christian believers, the follower of Christ began to meet, their gatherings would be filled with people from all over the world who were both Jewish and non-Jewish, right? Right? In fact, these places, we tracked Paul's travels just a moment ago. These were great Gentile cities, non-Jewish cities. Though there were synagogues in the place, the great bulk of people in the city were not Jewish. Is there anybody here in the house today who is Jewish? Anybody Jewish in the house today? No, I don't see any. We're all non-Jewish people here today. So we, you know, we would not be in the custom if we were in that day. We would not be in the custom of meeting on the Sabbath day. In fact, as the Gentiles, we didn't probably have any worship day. We just moved about and did our own worldly wicked things as heathen people. But when people began to come to faith in Christ and began to gather together as the body of Christ in these local cities, they adopted... The, the practice of worshiping the Lord on a weekly basis. And the early Christian Christians attended the regular week, weekly meeting of believers on the first day of the week. Everybody say the Sabbath day. Now say the first day. Now the Sabbath day was the seventh day. But the first day of the week was the first day. Here we are today. Even on our calendar, if you have a calendar today, you will note that we are meeting today, not on the seventh day, Saturday, but we are meeting on the first day of the week in observance of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Next Sunday morning, we will gather together for Resurrection Sunday services. We will celebrate the reality that Jesus, our Lord, who came to this world as a baby in a manger and lived a sinless life and performed mighty miracles, then died on the cross for our sins, we will celebrate the fact that Jesus, after he died for our sins on the cross, rose again from the dead on the first day of the week. And he is, everybody say, Jesus is alive. 
And the early believers then began to meet for their weekly meetings. Again, as Pastor Peter preached not long ago on a Wednesday night, it had already been established by God himself that uh, that one day a week would be set aside for worshiping the Lord. And the early believers adopted that custom and began to meet on the Lord's day as a commemoration of the resurrection of Jesus. We see it in the scripture there. Mark 16, Jesus rose early on the first day of the week. Acts 20, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. 1 Corinthians 16, on the first day of every week. And Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, even when John the Apostle has, has been exiled out to the island of Patmos and doesn't even have a church to meet with, his church is back in Ephesus. But he's been exiled out to the island of Patmos as a political prisoner. But even out on the old island of Patmos there as a prisoner, what is John doing on the first day of the week? He is having church even by himself in the presence of the Lord. And he says on the, on the he, he says uh, there in Revelation 1, I, John, your brother and companion, the suffering kingdom of patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. Mm. Yes, I was in the spirit. So the early Christians met on the Lord's day as a commemoration and they met on the Lord's day as a congregation and community. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4. Paul writes to the Corinthians, When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of the Lord is present, comma, we won't read the rest of the verse because the rest of the verse is kind of unpleasant. The rest of the verse says, Hand that man over to Satan, that, that sinner, but, but Paul is saying, when you come together for your regular meeting and the presence of God is there, there will be spiritual business to take care of. Now, let's take a moment to look to the backside of the outline. I hope you can tell I'm hurrying as fast as I can. If you can tell that, would you say a good amen? Well, thank you for those three amens. Look to the backside and let's think about the corporate church life of the early b believers because the New Testament prioritizes and codifies the life of the early church. What are, if we're going to be in church, how many of you have been in church a long time? Not this morning, I mean, but you've, you've been in church a lot of your life. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna be a part of a local church, how many of you believe we ought to make the best of it? Say Amen. And how many of you believe church ought to be what God intends it to be? Say amen. There are too many opportunities in the world in which we live where church has been transformed into something far different from what God wants it to be. We're not interested in that kind of church. We want to have a local church and local church meetings where God is glorified and where his work is done. Amen. So what does corporate church life look like in the New Testament? Look at these with me. Number one, individual believers were instructed to be fully functioning, productive members of their local church body. Now, is everybody awake with me today? Think about, here's why I'm showing you these items. Here's why I'm showing you these items. There are many people out there who will say, well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Sure you have. Well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I always say, well, uh, you do have to go to church to be an obedient Christian. Now, there are some exceptions. Sometimes we have people who are part of this congregation who are sick and feel and disabled and they have been a part of the congregation and were a, were a lively part of the congregation. Now they're stuck at home. They can't go to the grocery store. They can't go out to eat. They can't go to Walmart. They are stuck. They have a difficult situation and they can't be in church. And we understand that. And to the best of our ability, we try to go to them. Are you here? 
because we have, we have people who are watching right this minute online. I know a lady who I worked with in my early, early life who's watching us. She watches us. She and her husband, they watch every Sunday morning. Archie and Bev, we love you guys dearly. They're such a faithful part of this congregation. And nearly every Sunday, Bev writes something on Facebook about the service and she thinks I'm the best preacher in the world. Bev, 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 you are so right. Oh, how Archie and Bev wish they could be with us in the church services, but they are stuck. There are situations like that where people can't come to church and, and it's a different season for them and the body of Christ, listen, 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 the body of Christ has a responsibility to continue to envelop and, 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 and bring those people into the life of the body of believers. Would you say amen? Not just the pastors, but the people. And so, so the reason I'm showing you these points on the back of the outline is to say this to you. If, if, if somebody is not part of a local body of believers, then all of these New Testament purposes for the body of believers cannot be met. Are you listening? They cannot be met. Uh, not fully, not, not in the New Testament sense, no. So, Number one, individual believers were instructed to be fully functioning, productive members of their local church body. Romans 12, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members don't all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. Let's stop right here for an example. How many of you know that if you have the gift of prophesying, if, if the only place you're prophesying is to the mirror, you are falling far short of what the gift of prophecy is intended to accomplish? Are you here? Now, we welcome gifts of the Spirit right here in this congregation. Last uh, was it Tuesday night? This past Tuesday night, in our what a wonderful revival we had. This last week, wonderful presence of the Lord. On Tuesday evening, in that revival service, we had multiple people baptized in the Holy Spirit and uh, just a wonderful presence of the Lord in our Tuesday night, especially meeting all the services were good, but that Tuesday night was so powerful and so precious. And at the, near, near the conclusion of that service, Bev Fork, when you spoke out a prophetic word, it so rang true with affirmation in my spirit. Early in the service, I had sensed after Brother Denbo sang a song, I had sensed that the Lord wanted to bring his people a sense of security and safety by resting in him. And, and later in the service, when Bev spoke forth that word, that word declared, I am the Lord. I will carry you through the difficult situations of life. And that, that message just rang over and over again in my spirit. The Lord saying, I will carry you. I will carry you. I will support you. I will get you through. And, and as, as that word was being spoken forth, I thought this service is, is led by the Holy Spirit and the message of God is coming forth. Well, without the gifts of the Spirit, we would not receive many of those words of exhortation and encouragement from the Lord. We need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Would you say amen? And, and so as, as we come together, it, you know, what if Bev just decided she was gonna, I'm sorry, Bev, I don't need to put you on the spot today. What if Bev just decided she was gonna operate in that gift of the Spirit? The only place she was gonna operate was in the mirror at home. That gift would fall far short of its God-given purpose. Are you understanding that? Many things that the New Testament calls us to be involved in as believers involve relationship and corporate worship as a body of believers. Now, I can't spend that much time on all of these 13 points or I will be preaching to the mirror. <laughs> Individual believers were instructed to be fully functioning, productive members of their local church body too. 
believers were charged to give themselves fully to the work of the Lord in the body of Christ. Are you awake today? That means everybody under the sound of my voice today, if you're a Christian believer here at church, you're supposed to be contributing to what's going on here at the house of the Lord and in this local body of believers. You may have uh, something that seems to be a traditional kind of ministry or you may have something very untraditional. Part of your work may just be smiling at people and welcoming people and being real friendly to people so they are encouraged at the house of the Lord. There are many different ways in which God will use us but we're supposed to be committed to the work of God. Number three, believers were urged to be operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit during the meetings in order to bring strengthening, encouragement, and comfort to one another, okay? So it's not just the preacher preaching, it's believers ministering to one another. You got it? If you don't, if you don't get it, I'll read all the scriptures. <laughs> Number four, leadership gifts were given to the local church for the purpose of directing the affairs of the church and preparing God's people for works of service. And there are all kinds of leadership gifts in the local body of believers. There are pastors and overseers. There are deacons who are servant leaders. There are positions like that. There are elders who direct the affairs of the church. Paul writes to these leadership leaders as Paul is journeying through the region of Galatia, the Bible says it, on one of his missionary journeys, he is establishing leadership in each of those local bodies. As Paul writes to Titus on the island of Crete, he says, the reason I've left you there on the island of Crete is that you might straighten out the church business that's been left unfinished and that you might establish leadership in the various churches there on the island and so God has established leadership in the local churches to, to assist in the process of all of these things. Number five, believers were to be ministering to the needy among their ranks, even to the point of establishing a list of widows who had no family support. So I know that we're living in a kind of a, you know, an increasingly uh, welfare society in where the where we think it's the, the you know it's the government's job to care for people all the time but the body of believers has a responsibility to help one another according to the new testament and to be sure people are 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 supplied for number 6 the church services were to feature public reading of scripture preaching and teaching paul wrote to timothy in 1 timothy 4 until i come Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. And 2 Timothy 4, Paul writes to, to Timothy again, Preach the word. Be what? Be what? Be prepared. In season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So there's supposed to be biblical teaching and preaching. Number seven, is everybody still with me? Say amen. Amen. The ministry of singing and worshiping <coughs> was to bring encouragement to the church. Speak to one another, Ephesians 5, 19, with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. So they're supposed to be preaching and teaching, right? Check the box. Supposed to be singing and worship, right? Check the box. Supposed to be gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Check the box. Supposed to be people working together and encouraging one another, right? Check the box. We're talking about these things. And number eight, believers were to celebrate the Lord's Supper in their church services. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that as often as we do this, we're to celebrate in, in memory of the Lord Jesus. Number nine, the local church was to work and give in order to support missionary and ministry work. So here we go. And you know what? So far, do you see that in all of these categories, we got a pretty good thing going here at First Assembly. 
don't we? You say, well, yeah, we, you know, this, this is a good local body of believers. Yes. One of the great privileges of my, of my ministry all these years, even though when I started here as the lead pastor, I, I, I did, as many of you know, come into kind of a broken situation. But even in the midst of that broken situation, this was not a broken church. We had a lot of good things going. This was a church full of believers who loved the Lord and worshiped the Lord and wanted the word of God declared and were determined to serve Jesus. Could you say amen? amen. So it was one of my great privileges to step right in and start my ministry in a place where the people of God wanted to have real church when we came together. Thank the Lord. Amen. I don't know if I'd made it in some other churches. Well, I don't know. I don't have to wonder that, do I? Because here I am right now. But, but we, have a, we have a lot of good things going. These are biblical principles. Number 10, believers were called to join together in prayer for one another. James chapter five, to pray for the sick, to, to confess to each other when we need to confess things to each other. We were called to pray for one another. Number 11, <coughs> Believers were called to encourage one another and build one another up in their faith. Look at me right now, everybody. Every person under the sound of my voice, if you're a Christian believer, part of this body, you are responsible for encouraging and building others up. And others are responsible for doing the same for you. We're called to strengthen each other in the body of Christ. Number 12, believers in the local church were called to develop deep, faithful, loving relationships with one another. Now look up at me, everybody. For those people who just come to church and they just dart in the door and dart out the door, they, don't, they never meet anybody and they never build any relationships with the rest of the body of Christ, that is not a biblical picture of a local church, Okay? We are called as believers in a local body to build relationships with one another. And we see it all through the New Testament. Ephesians 4, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you, as in Christ God forgave you. Galatians 6, 2, carry each other's burdens and in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Philippians 4, I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Two women in the church at Philippi were at odds with each other. Two fighting women in the church. Can you picture that? And Paul writes to them and says, you two women there at Philippi, you need to get along. And then Paul continues his instruction and says, and you, leader, help these women to get along. Hmm? And in other words, knock the heads together if you need to. They, got, you got, they, got, they need to get, they got to get along together now. The, 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 are you hearing me? Yes. The work of God, the kingdom of God, the testimony of believers, huh? Yes. Is far too important for believers in a local body of believers to be at odds with each other and always fighting with each other. Right. Huh? Could I have a better amen? amen? So we're called to build healthy relationships, help those women. Ephesians 5 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 1 Peter 2, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Are there people in this body of believers whom you love deeply? I hope there are because that's, that's the picture of a healthy body of believers. Oh, I kind of like them, but I don't, really know. I don't really know anybody there. I go to church there, but I don't really know anybody there. Listen, if you don't know anybody, how can you develop deep love for the brothers and sisters? Huh? That's why we have all of these opportunities here at First Assembly to get together and to know each other, to encourage one another. And our, our last lady, and the ladies are about to take over the church. At our last ladies event, Deanna, what do we have? 91, 91 ladies? I, I wanted, it, it, was, it was an event called Breakfast for Dinner. And I'm not a lady, but I wanted to go <laughs> because of the subject matter of the meeting. 
But here they are, meeting, coming, to, going to church, worshiping together, uh, taking times to fellowship together, to meet one another, to study the Bible together, to do all of these things in order to build meaningful relationships in the body of Christ. We're called to that. And number 13, believers, this is a miracle of miracles I've gotten this far. Believers were instructed to be active in sharing their faith and to welcome unbelievers into, into the assembly. Look at my scriptures, Philemon 6. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you'll have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. 1 Peter 3, 15. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now, now, okay, so this is our relationship with unbelievers. Now, our last verse, we get them to church. We, we get our unsaved friends to church with us. Look at it in 1 Corinthians 14, 24. If an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in to, to the church service while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare so he will fall down and worship God right there in the service. And he will declare, he will exclaim, God is really among you. Huh? And, and so believers were called to welcome unbelievers into the assembly and, listen, and to be creating spiritually the kind of spiritual atmosphere where even unbelievers who come into the service will experience the real presence of God. Don't you want that? I, I'll tell you, every person who ever comes through the doors of this sanctuary and comes in here, I don't care what kind of a life they've lived or what kind of a life they're living. They need Jesus. Amen. And when they come into this place, we don't want them to leave saying, well, there it was, another dead, dry church service. No, we want them to say, oh, the presence of God was in that place. They may not even understand it. They may not understand all that's going on, but, but they sensed, oh, God is here. And you know what? As, as we hold church services, that is our chief desire. Amen? We want, we want to be here, and we want God to be here doing his work. And so back to the front side, we find that the scripture has commanded. Everybody say the word commanded, number six that Christian believers are commanded not to give up meeting together as many are in the habit of doing. We must church with one another. Hebrews 10, 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Now you, you have seen and I have seen people be faithful for a while and then drop out for months. That is a clear violation of the New Testament. Are you here? And, and people sometimes say, well, I'm too busy to go to church, but they're not too busy to eat out at the restaurant and go to Walmart and do all this kind of stuff. They can do everything else they want to do, but somehow they don't have time to go to church. Uh-uh. Some people choose their own schedules so that they can be out of church. Some people choose, you know, I, I, I hope you don't get mad at me here this morning. But some people choose to, to design their work schedule all around church services and they can't come to church. You know, I always say to people, if you can't come to church on Sunday because you work every Sunday, then carve out time Wednesday night and let Wednesday night be your weekly church service. But some people, no, they can't come on Sunday morning. They can't. There's no time that the church is meeting that they can come to church. And to, listen, friends, what I have to say to, to say to that is simply this. No one can serve two masters. Are you here? If you're going to be a real deal, serious Christian, then if you can, until there perhaps comes a time and season in your life where you just can't go you, because of your, your physical limitations or, or your, the sicknesses that you have in, in your life, you just can't go. But until then, if you can get out and go, Every believer is called to be faithful to the gatherings 
of believers. I, I wish I had a better amen in the house today. Because it's true. So next time, time somebody throws out that old bunch of baloney to you, well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. That is not even the question. The question is, are you an obedient Christian? Living to please God, huh? Wanting to draw closer to the Lord, yes. Wanting to grow in your faith, right? Wanting to be used by the Lord to bless other believers, right? Doing our part in the body of Christ, yes. So all of these things, you just, you just can't absent yourself from being in, with the people of God in church. You just can't give up meeting together and fulfill all of the things that God has instructed you to be and to do. You just can't. I urge people, I hear reports, I, hear, I urge people who dropped out of church because of a virus going around, which, impact, which by the way, impacted my life greatly. Are you here? And impacted many of your lives. But I urge people who have dropped out of church and who have not gotten back into the, the habit of being faithful to the house of God because of the risk of a sickness, I urge them to obey the Lord and get back in church. And especially, you know, if they're darting out about, about around town doing everything under the sun, but they're still using that as an excuse not to go to church, all I can say is the devil has really put one over on you. Now, again, I can't, I can't scold the people who are here because of the people who are not here. But I want everybody under the sound of my preaching to have a clear, balanced, biblical view of things. Huh? So we must church together. Secondly, we must, as we do that, we must challenge one another. Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together. Nina, this Tuesday night, is that right? This to, stand up, Nina Meeks, stand up, Nina Meeks. This Tuesday night starts our first outreach to the trailer park out at Apache Flats. We, had, we have had like 40-some people get on board. If you're a part of the Apache Flats uh, trailer park ministry team, would you stand right now? Come on, stand right now. Don't, don't, just, don't hesitate. Stand right now if you're part of that team. I, I am so excited. I'm so excited. And, and what these teams are doing, they're, they're spurring one another on toward doing the work of God. And there are many examples of that in our congregation. We must challenge one another and we must cheer one another. We're in difficult days and Hebrews 10, 24 says this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more, everybody say all the more. more. Say it out loud, "All all the more. All the more as you see the day approaching. Jesus is coming. We don't know when. I'm not going to declare that Jesus is coming next week or this fall on the you know, at the Feast of Trump. I'm not going to declare when Jesus is coming. He is coming. And one thing is certain, and this is a biblical principle too, too. now is your salvation nearer than when you first believed. Now, how many of you know there's such a thing as time in this life we live? Okay. How many of you realize that according to time right now, the coming of the Lord is closer than it was last year? Okay, that's an obvious And our time is limited. The day of the Lord may be the day when Jesus raptures us to heaven, but I believe for some of us, there's going to be a personal day of the Lord when we stand before the presence of the Lord Jesus. We maybe are snatched out of this life before the coming of Jesus, you know, for the rapture. And here we are, we we are snatched out of this life. It's time for us to stand before God. And as we stand before God, our our time on this earth will will be finished. Till a future date for this limited life. 
And as we see the coming of the, I believe that as we continue forward in our lives, we ought to be growing in, in our relationship with the Lord, amen? We ought to be growing in our relationship with the local body, amen? We ought to be growing in being the people God's called us to be, right? And as we see the day approaching, let us just plug in to what God is doing in the local body more and more and more. And let's allow Jesus, who himself was consumed with zeal for the house of the Lord. Let's let the priorities and the love and the passion of Jesus fill our hearts as well. So we will say with the psalmist in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord and do the business of God's people. Amen, amen.